Top Shelf Classic Lager. Brewed using only the finest noble hops and Canadian malt, this crisp and refreshing lager aims high and scores big. From Lake of Bay's Brewing Company in partnership with the NHL Alumni Association. Available at the LCBO and the beer store. You're listening to Life After the Game. Brought to you by Gong Show Gear. The show that profiles former NHL players on their playing days and current lives after hockey. Here's your host, Darcy Lynch. My guest today is Jamie Rivers. Played over 450 NHL games with seven teams, the majority with the St. Louis Blues. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for coming on the show. And, Jamie, I want to start things off by talking first about your time playing in the OHL for the Sudbury Wolves. In the early 90s, your last season being named top defenseman in the league. But you were a teammate of Mike Yo, And those of us in the media and the fans, we associate the name Mike Yo with, obviously, his coaching and his current role with the Minnesota Wild. But he was a, a player before that playing in the OHL and then onwards to an AHL career. What was he like as a teammate back in the early 90s playing with him in junior? Yeah, you know, um, Mike was a great guy. You know, he was part of, uh, always part of the team in a good way. You know, was ready to, he was one of the boys. Uh, he worked extremely hard, and I think that that's probably what has translated to success in, in the pro coaching business is that he always worked hard. He always tried to do the right things. Uh, you know, he had a role within the team. He wasn't blessed with uh, massive offensive ability, uh, but he was tough as nails. And, you know, he, every inch that he earned out there on the ice, I'm telling you, he, he did a great job and was just a great guy. It was, it was fun, you know, because just like your typical hockey player, uh, great guy was in the group, played his butt off for the team and for the coaches and, um, you know, and hung out with all his teammates. Well, and speaking of coaching, when you moved on from Sudbury and broke into the NHL in the mid-90s with St. Louis, uh, around that time, that the coaches that you would have been breaking into the league with, or with Mike Keenan and Joel Quinville, uh, certainly very established coaches, but not guys that are necessarily known as the most warm and fuzzy and they're going to cuddle you whenever you're first breaking into the league. What was that like being a young player in the league, trying to break into the league full-time and having uh, some of the most, two of the most fierce coaches as your first ones? Yeah, you know, I had good preparation for that in a couple of ways. You know, when we had uh, Glenn Murkowski in Sudbury coaching us, uh, he was a real hard worker as a player, and he was a you know, real disciplinarian with the team. Um, so you kind of get used to things in that way. And then my first year uh, playing in the American League, I had Jimmy Roberts, who was about as old school as a gets as far as a coach and player, and he had all these Stanley Cup rings from playing in Montreal and Jimmy was such a no-nonsense guy that, you know, you kind of knew how to approach every day. So I had some preparation going into it. Now, of course, the preparation didn't include the uh, all the emotional ups and downs that it would be with, with Mike Keenan. Uh, you know, he usually had an older team, and I think the reason he had an older team was because, you know, he is so hard on the players. And once you get used to them, you kind of understand them. But until you get to that point, and some guys never get to that point, uh, it's tough to understand exactly what he's trying to accomplish. And, but I'm just going to say, I mean, it, it was confusing. And he'd get called up for a game. Uh, he'd do the morning skate, and they'd get set back down before the game back to the American League. And it was you know, somewhat confusing for a younger guy because you think, well, I'm getting my shot to play a game. And you know, I went on a road trip with them for like eight days, and – I was called up for the games and sent back down the next day. And it wasn't just like short ones. We were doing a California swing, and I was playing in Worcester near Boston. So it was cross country. I had so many air miles by the end of the week, I didn't even know where the heck I was. <laughs> so, you know, but that, you know, that stuff like that makes you mentally tougher. Um, you know, and Joel's a different kind of tough coach. He's a player's coach, but, you know, he, being a former player the way he is, the way he was, he can give it to guys. And, you know, it's, it's looked upon not so much as, oh, he's being such a hard ass. You know, you're looking at it going, you know what? This guy's played the game. He's not talking down to me. He's telling me what it is. And if he's not happy, that means I'm not doing it right. And I think you're seeing that more and more now with Quenville, with especially the Chicago Blackhawks. I mean, talk about a team that, you know, have a ton of personality, a ton of guys that are able to do great things on the ice. Yet, you know, they're winning championships here lately. And I think it's because Joel has a, a great way of communicating with the players and letting them know that 
They're in it together. It's not him against them. This is Life After the Game, brought to you by Gong Show Gear. This week's guest is former NHLer Jamie Rivers. And when you're talking about your time in St. Louis and needing to be mentally tough when you're playing under a coach like Mike Keenan, I'm interested to, to hear what your experiences were like with Brett Hull. You played with him early in your career in St. Louis. You also would have been a teammate of him in Detroit. And the reason that I ask about Hull is he is one player where when he came up on this show, the, it isn't necessarily the most consistent recollections that players have of him. That there's clearly, you know, he's one of the most comical guys in the league. And there's a lot of guys have regaled great stories about their years playing with Brett. But there's others who have talked about, especially when they were breaking into the league, that he wasn't the easiest player on rookies. What was your overall relationship like with Brett? Well, I had a great relationship with Brett. Um, and still do to this day. I mean, we, we only live about 15 minutes apart here in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, I think he gets, <laughs> I think a lot of people get confused with Brett. He gets misinterpreted sometimes. You know, he, uh, he's got a very dry kind of humor and he gets a kick out of saying things that are like right out of left field. And as he's walking away, he's giggling to himself, but everybody thinks he's serious. And, you know, there's a lot of times, even when I was a rookie, I used a long stick, you know, and he always gave it to me every day about, that's too long, that's too long. And one day he walked in and, you know, had some netting from one of the nets that were done down below, and he taped it up to my stick and acted like he was using it as a pool stir. So, you know, I just laughed <laughs> that stuff up, though. And Brett loves the humor, so you start giving it back to him, he actually enjoys it. So, you know, my... I guess my time with Brett Hull is probably different than some other guys uh, along the way. But realistically, all he wanted to do was win hockey games, and he wanted us to do well, and he wanted to play hard. And he obviously, he loved scoring goals, too. So, you know, I can't fault the guy for that. And when he was here in St. Louis, you know, a lot was made of the fact that, well, he never got the team anywhere. You know, didn't get to the conference finals, didn't get them to the Stanley Cup. But it's amazing and when he went elsewhere, he brought the Dallas Stars to the Cup and the Detroit Red Wings. So, you know, I don't think uh, any of those things that people say about Brett, uh, I don't think people should read into that too much. A lot of stuff he says is for reaction purposes only. And trust me, he has a great time walking away from some of those discussions, just giggling to himself. And with Ottawa being your hometown, Jamie, I'm interested to hear about your time playing for the Ottawa Senators and specifically around that 1999-2000 season. Alexi Yashin's last season with the club, he was a teammate of yours, but it was a very unique circumstance that season that he sat out the year before in a contract dispute and then had to fulfill his contract for one final season and it was clear that the writing was on the wall that he was going to be leaving Ottawa, but he's still the star player of the team and leading the team in points. What was that like being in the room, playing with Alexi, when everyone in the team knows that he wants out and several players in the team were anxious to get him off the team as well? It must have been a very interesting dynamic in that locker room. Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, I want to give credit to Marshall Johnson, who was the GM there, because realistically, what he did with that situation was just genius. And I say that because Yash had one year left on his contract, and he wanted to get out of Ottawa so bad well, if he wouldn't have had a crappy year, then he wouldn't have been going anywhere for any kind of good market value. So, you know, Marshall Johnson knew this guy's going to have to produce this year. So we might as well throw him in there. Everybody just, you know, kind of operate as normal. Don't worry about all the BS. This guy will score some points. This guy will do, he'll do something for this team. And, you know, if memory serves me correctly, he had a hell of a year that year in 2000. I mean, he scored a lot of goals. He, I think he was our top point getter. So, you know, Marshall kind of played the little Jedi mind game with Yash on that one. Um, but, you know, really, Yash wasn't a bad guy. You know, maybe he gets some heat here and there about things, but he was really, really good in the locker room. You know, not a boisterous guy, not a guy that you're looking at to say, oh, yeah, I want to take the mountain with this guy. I mean, he's not one of those guys. But he certainly wasn't disruptive. Kind of kept to himself, kind of did his thing. And, you know, it's a shame that – the business side of it kind of got wrapped into it and whatnot. But, hey, Yash brought in a lot of that on himself by making decisions and doing what he did. And, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it didn't work out in Ottawa and didn't work out too well for him uh, in the short term in, in Long Island and all those things. We know where all that ended up. Um, but, really, he wasn't a distraction to the team. Uh, maybe he could have performed 
better. In fact, he could have performed better in the playoffs that year if he would have had his head screwed on straight. Jamie, I recall reading a few years back about a very scary incident that you were involved with while playing uh, in Austria after your NHL career had wound up and that you ruptured your spleen while playing in a game. I'd just like you to speak to that. I'm sure it was a very long recuperation, and I believe it was around five seasons ago. Yeah, it's all, uh, it's all just at the end. Kind of, I don't want to say my swan song in hockey because, quite honestly, I would have still been playing somewhere over in Europe if you know none of this would have happened. But it certainly, uh, yeah, it, 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 it hit me hard, and, and those were difficult times for sure. You played in Austria, Switzerland, and Russia. Is there a, one, any one of those experiences that jumps out at you that was the best circumstance for you to be able to follow up your NHL career with? Yeah, you know what? I wish I would have followed up on a Swiss um, team that had inquired about me. I think it was 2004. Um, Lugano, Switzerland, had called me and really had offered a really great deal for me to go over there and offered private schooling for my kids, which was like 30 grand uh, out of their pocket. And I didn't take it. I, I took a deal here with the St. Louis Blues. Uh, I was living here in St. Louis, and I viewed it as a chance to, you know, go at it one more time and maybe make it work here in St. Louis. And um, unfortunately, I think I picked the wrong door there. I ended up kind of up and down and bopping around after that, where, whereas the Swiss team was offering me a three-year deal. Um, but you know what? I look at it as uh, it, you only get to play in the NHL once in your lifetime, and it would have been foolish of me to pass that up uh, at that time. Well, you mentioned whenever you were signing with the Blues in your second stint in St. Louis that you were living there, and that's that's where you currently are, is is you're based in Missouri. And major focus of this show is bringing exposure to what former NHL is up to now. Tell us about Synergy Hockey Skills and your role with the company. Well, it started a while back, right before the lockout year, this last one. Um, You know, I had started doing some skills work in the offseason with some NHL guys who were back here in St. Louis. And as we know now, the game is headed in a direction where, you know, the, the strength and conditioning coach used to just be an accessory. Well, now it's a must, you know, and I see where in the future the skills coach is going to be absolutely mandatory because teams have so much money invested in these players. And, you know, you have to develop them quickly, faster than ever. You have to get your first round, second round guys into the NHL. So that being said, I was doing some work here for the Blues and uh, working with some of the younger guys and, and doing things and, and helping out. Then the lockout hit. So obviously everybody scatters. Um, and I continue to work with the guys who are here in town, probably about 10 or 11 guys, sometimes 12. Uh, we worked through the entire lockout. And then I had a chance to join the Blues for their training camp and be a part of that. And I, I kind of saw that, you know, uh, an opening there where I could do something within the game of hockey and have it still be fun and be on the ice and do all these things that I love so much. So, you know, we started to, to build this company, which ultimately has ended up being called Synergy Hockey. And it's skills training and skill development for all levels and all youth ages. Um, but we obviously we specialize in the junior college NHL player uh, that's out there right now. They're looking to tweak their game a little bit, or if there's a deficiency in their game, if their agent calls me or the NHL club calls me and talks to me about it, then you know I'll hammer that home for four or five weeks with them and hopefully hand them back a better player than than what was sent to me. So, you know, it, it's funny because I got in on kind of backwards where I went from the top and now I've worked my way all the way down to like little kids that are five and six. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a unique situation to get into the game or get into this kind of business like that. But I think it's been great because I learned with the toughest clients ever, which are current NHLers. And, you know, sometimes it, like, like they say, the, uh, the old dog is hard to teach new tricks. 
This is Life After the Game, brought to you by Gong Show Gear. I'm Darcy Lynch. This week's guest is former NHL defenseman Jamie Rivers. And that's a very interesting company that you're dealing with, Synergy Hockey. Dealing with everything from youth right up to NHLers is certainly very unique, as a lot of the former players who are running similar businesses that we hear about on this show, it typically is usually only targeted at youth. But the fact that yours is a very broad scope going towards youth and professionals at the same time, uh, is certainly uh, it makes it very unique. And dealing with the NHL players that you were talking of and, and dealing with organizations and coaches with your current business, it brings to mind that I've no doubt that you're still dealing with the Coyotes organization, uh, a team that you played for. But when you were there, you played under Wayne Gretzky. And that had to have been challenging, uh, I'm sure, for a depth player like yourself whenever you're taking orders from the most decorated player to ever play the game. Yeah, that's a unique situation. And you know what? I was really lucky because um, I had been on the same team with Wayne here in St. Louis when his brief stint with the Blues. So, you know, going into that situation, we already knew each other. We had spent time together. It wasn't like I was going to walk in and be like, oh, my God, there's the great one. You know, like I, I kind of did all that when I was here in St. Louis. And Gretz was actually a, a big part in – going to Phoenix and getting traded there, he wanted to bring in a guy that he felt could play hard minutes and, you know, teach these younger guys what it takes to kind of become an NHL defenseman. So the fit was good for me, and, you know, he was great with me. He told me I was going to play against the other team's top lines. He wanted me to relax. He wanted me to play the way I had when I was younger, which is a little more, you know, wheeling the puck, get up in the play. It's actually some of the best hockey I ever played in my career was in my short stint with the Phoenix Coyotes. And I owe a lot of that to Wayne for just being really relaxed and, you know, letting me kind of find, find my game again. Um, so that was great. Now, of course, like you said, you got the great one. And Gretz and I talked about this a couple of years ago at a wedding when we were having a few cocktails. And he kept talking about players and this and that and the other. Finally, I said, I go, Gretz. You got to understand something, you know. You're never going to be able to teach what you had. I said because what you had, you can't teach. So if a player doesn't have this ability to have the eyes in the back of his head, make passes perfect on the tape, you know, accelerate, decelerate, turn up, all these things that Gretz did so good, well, you're not going to be able to teach a guy to do that because that's you know that's why Gretz is the greatest one of all time because nobody else has been able to duplicate that. So. I think it was probably more frustrating for Wayne to coach guys in the NHL than it was for the players because, you know, he had these expectations in his own brain of things that he could do and the, you know, the logic behind why he did it. Yet, you know, you can't cast that information to somebody else and say, here, process it and come back looking like I did. It just doesn't happen that way. So, you know, I thought Gretz was great as a player's coach. Uh, you know, he he relied heavily upon Barry Smith and Rick Bonus for some of the X's and O's with it. But I think ultimately it was a lot harder for some of the guys to perform under Wayne because they always felt they had to do what he had done before instead of just doing their own job. Well, certainly a very interesting perspective that you do have, having been both a former teammate and being able to play under the great one. And one last one for you, Jamie, before we sign off. As I've mentioned, Gong Show Gear, an Ottawa-based company from the from your hometown, being the sponsor of the show. And I know you're a big fan of their gear that you were mentioning off-air. But the word Gong Show itself can be used a lot of times when, it, when talking about journeymen in the NHL and the ups and downs that go with that and sometimes the way that organizations will treat you. And you, you were a depth player on a lot of great teams and you, a great teammate. Your name has came up numerous times with former NHLers talking about some of the, the best uh, glue guys on a particular team. And I also know that you're very humble. I just was recently reading your, your Twitter handle and saying, uh, I'm good in the locker room, and that's where they left me most of the time. But it's great to be able to find some, <laughs> it's great to be able to find humor in that. You know, one of the greatest reads I've ever read uh, on the NHL is Sean Pronger's Journeyman book. But you, you were a journeyman as well. And I'm just wondering if you could share any example of, I use the guy gong show words, but like a gong show moment that could only happen to a, to a journeyman that something that the players who sign a contract and stay in the same organization for 10 years could never experience that only someone who knows the ups and downs of the league could experience. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll try to make this brief. I know you guys have a time crunch. Um, it was my first year in Worcester playing in the American hockey league. And I'm going to go right back to what I talked about earlier, where Mike Keenan was calling me up cross country, then sending me right back down to play a game in the American League. So I was going back and forth, up and down, up and down. 
Well, I finally get sent down for the last one, which was we had played in San Jose, and then he read, you know, the, the overnighter all the way back into Hartford because the Ice Cats, my Worcester team, was playing in Springfield the next afternoon. So, obviously, I get there, and there's not a lot of sleep. I'm standing at the airport. Nothing. My bags, my sticks, nothing has come through at all. So, <laughs> now I've got to try and tell Jimmy Roberts, who's like, you know, the, the original six type guy, like, you know, it, it, it's hard enough to say anything to the guy anyways, let alone, hey, I don't have my gear. And we had some guys that were injured who was expecting me to play. Uh, so I just said, you know, I'm not a high maintenance guy. And I think any trainer that you talk to throughout my career will tell you, yeah, Riz never even looked at his skates, you know? And <laughs> thank God for that because I just got to, the, I went to the rink with the team and talked to our equipment guy. And I said, look, I go, just tell. Springfield to pack a bag of hockey gear, give me somebody's extra skates and get me one stick and I'll play. I don't care. So everybody's laughing, of course. And you know, their, their trainers were giving me crappy gear stuff. That was like, from you know, probably the seventies is what I'm putting on my body. And of course, everybody's getting a chuckle out of it and whatnot, but managed to go out there, kind of figure the gear out during warm up, and went on to have a pretty good game, scored a goal and assist, and won the game. <laughs> and then after the game, everybody said, well, maybe you should be wearing the crappy gear all the time. Make you a lot better player. <laughs> so, yeah, I get to say that I, uh, I played a professional ice hockey game while showing up at the rink and using somebody else's complete set of gear, including skates. <laughs> Great story. Kind of a gong show. Yeah, that's for sure. Thanks for coming on the show, Jamie, and sharing some stories about your NHL career and also your current business, Synergy Hockey. And glad to hear that you like sporting your gong show gear around the St. Louis area and keep warm this winter with that pond hockey trapper hat that you've ordered from gongshowgear.com. I will. When I get it, I'm going to put it all on. I'll put it on Twitter and tag you guys on it. Great stuff. And thanks again for coming on the show, Jamie, and we'll, we'll connect again down the road. All right. Thanks a lot for having me. Take care. You've been listening to Life After the Game, brought to you by Gong Show Gear, the premier manufacturer of lifestyle hockey apparel. Check them out at gongshowgear.com. Thanks to this week's guest, Jamie Rivers. I'm Darcy Lynch. You can follow this show on Twitter, at Darcy P. Lynch. Top Shelf Classic Lager. Brewed using only the finest noble hops in Canadian malt, this crisp and refreshing lager aims high and scores big. From Lake of Bay's Brewing Company in partnership with the NHL Alumni Association. Available at the LCBO and the Beer Store.